Hi guys, welcome back. So today I wanted to address a question that was in the comments recently. Someone asked, how do I read poetry? Like how is there a correct way to read a poem, to interpret a poem? Um, how should I go about it? And so I think that this question is uh, pretty common. I think a lot of us, when we first start reading poetry, have this perception that there is a correct way to do it and that we're not doing it right. Um, and this video is basically to squash that claim, um, but it's also a video that it kind of addresses what does it even mean to experience a poem? What is poetry? How does it function? All that kind of fun nerdy stuff that I have loved to think about over the past year. So just as a disclaimer, I am no expert at this. I am a passionate reader of poetry. I have been for a few years. I've also researched poetry for the past year and written my undergraduate dissertation on whether poetry can do philosophy and if so how um, and I am a poet myself but all of that does not mean that I am an expert by any means this is just one person's opinion um, but I hope that it's an intelligent opinion and that one that kind of will explain and debunk some myths about poetry quite well so uh, if that sounds interesting to you keep watching and thanks uh, to Sinke Lima, I hope I'm pronouncing your username right, for asking this question. So what is poetry? So I think a lot of us, when we start reading poetry, we think that poetry is this like rhyming text. Essentially, that's all that makes a poem. Or a poem is something that is visually represented on a page in kind of a, a different way, kind of presented like verse. And while that can be true of poetry, I think the essence of poetry isn't simply that. I think poetry is something that resonates. It's not something that rhymes, it's something that resonates. It awakens something within you, a part of your soul, perhaps. Um, it expresses a relationship or an experience or a relationship with experience in an interesting form, given the fact that it is expressed through language. Um, and I think that generally speaking, poetry has meaning that goes beyond words. So one of my favorite quotes from my research uh, for my undergrad dissertation was from the book Lyric Philosophy by Jan Swicky, and it says that lyric poetry or lyric philosophy uses words that are bent to the shape of wordlessness that give thoughts the power to move. And I think that is probably the best way to describe how poems function within language. They use words, but they bend them to the shape of wordlessness. Now, what on earth does that mean? I think that the fact that poetry takes place using language, but it operates using meaning as its essential material, not words. Like, I think that's what the quote is trying to say. And going back to like resonance, what is resonance? Uh, resonance is basically a metaphor uh, that comes from music and music is a lyric experience experiencing music and the way that all the different parts come together and interact with each other that is a lyric experience but what's interesting about poetry is that it uses language which is usually systematic and linear it uses language and allows that to resonate so i would say that the essential material of poetry is not words it's meaning and uh what's unique about poetry is that it uses language the systematic um or linear medium and it desystematizes it it connects it in ways that aren't usually connected and through that it allows your thoughts to move around in a very unique way um so if you want to get extra super nerdy if you're following me so far we could say that poems operate through gestalt um, a gestalt is a form of understanding and a jans wiki the philosopher poet musician that i quoted earlier argues that gestalt is actually the experience of meaning in the world um, and so gestalt is essentially seeing a pattern or a shape among the chaos and arguably the joy of realizing a gestalt um, is why we are so drawn to poetry. Um, so there are visual examples of Gestalt, there are mathematical examples um, and auditory examples of Gestalt, but I would say that poetry is a linguistic, a very unique linguistic example of Gestalt. If you're interested in reading more about Gestalt theory and kind of how it works and how poetry fits into that, I would really recommend the book The Experience of Meaning by Jan Swicky. It's really fantastic, really interesting philosophy read if you're interested. All right, so now that we've covered like what is poetry, how it works, works through resonance, through meaning, um, 
it uses language in this unique way. How do we read poetry? You can see already, I hope, uh, the problem that arises when we're kind of thinking about poetry and we're attempting to read it, and especially when we're attempting to analyze it, which is what the question was asking of me. Like, how do I analyze a poem? How do I interpret it? Is there a right way to do it? Now, I think that the categories of correctness, of right and wrong, um, are essentially analytic categories that are incompatible with poetry with incompatible with lyric and the way that lyric and poetry and all of that kind of experience functions. So I don't think there's a right way to read a poem. I don't think there's a right way to interpret a poem. In fact, I think what poetry does is it shows us meaning. It, sh it, it expresses experience in a way that allows us to confront our inability to analyze and allows us to confront the complexity of experience. It shows us that there's no correct way to do things, there's no correct way to experience something. Like you wouldn't say like, how do I taste correctly? Like you don't taste correctly, you just taste. And I think that's what the experience of reading poetry is like. You just have to immerse yourself in it and um, see all of the parts and feel all of the parts coming together and for some people they might experience a gestalt through poetry for others maybe if they're not reading a fantastically written poem or maybe if they're just inexperienced with reading poetry they'll just read it as language but I think a really good poem will allow you to surpass that systematic barrier of language um, quite naturally and you don't have to be an expert reader to enjoy or get something out of a poem Another really unique factor of poetry uh, that Matilda made a video about recently that I absolutely love and I will link it in the description for you guys to go watch. She notes in that video that there is this thing about poetry uh, which is analogous to experience where you can't really experience a poem at once. You can't experience it as a whole. Um, and that's because it is temporal. That is because you have to read it. Your eyes are moving across the page from each word to the next. And so like, there's no way to capture the essence of a poem in one foul swoop, if you will. A poem is a succession of moments, just like the experience of the world, the experience of time, the experience of love. Everything is an experience of a succession of moments and so is a poem. And so it, it can be really difficult to paraphrase a poem to get at its essential meaning. I think often poetry has more than one meaning. That's kind of the problem. Like poetry is this very unique uh, way of expressing or using language to get at meaning. And sometimes what it does is it breaks down language in order to reveal something behind it. Um, because if you think about it, our, ex our experience of the world is so different from the, the way that we express things using language. And so poetry is kind of like a breakdown of that. But I'd like to read you some examples of poetry to kind of hammer down this point um, and then close the video. So I've got a few very different poets here. Um, first and foremost, I have E.E. E. Cummings, one of my favorite poets. This is a collection uh, that looks at his writing between 1923 and 1958, and I think he was such a master of uh, poetry and how it works is really well expressed through his writing. So I have uh, two poems to read to you here. This is one of my favorite ones. Spring is like a perhaps hand, which comes carefully out of nowhere, arranging a window into which people look while people stare, arranging and changing, placing carefully there a strange thing, a known thing here, and changing everything carefully. Spring is like a perhaps hand in a window, carefully to and fro, moving new and old things while people stare carefully, moving a perhaps fraction of a flower here, placing an inch of air there, and without breaking anything. I love this poem so much. I think the experience of reading this poem is also uh, unique because E. Cummings plays a lot with um, symbols, like he'll use uh, a comma somewhere you wouldn't expect. He spaces his poems in a very interesting way. He uses, um, I don't know what they're called, the, the things that like hug words, um, brackets or something like that. Uh, I think there's another word for them. But essentially, uh, yeah, so I could spend time trying to analyze this poem, but I think hearing it or reading it 
is its experience and um, what I love about it is this idea that spring is like a perhaps. Um, that's a very unconventional way to use that term, um, using it as a noun, but I think it gets a meaning across that wouldn't otherwise be accessible. So yeah, okay, another really great poem of his is about time. I love time. Okay. In times a noble mercy of proportion with generosities beyond believing, though flesh and blood accuse him of coercion or mind and soul convict him of deceiving, whose ways are neither reasoned nor unreasoned. His wisdom counsels conflict and agreement. Saharas have their centuries, 10,000 of which are smaller than a rose's moment. There's time for laughing and there's time for crying, for hoping, for despair, for peace, for longing, a time for growing and a time for dying, a night for silence and a day for singing. But more than all, as all your more than eyes tell me, there is a time for timelessness. I love this final line, but more than all, as all your more than eyes tell me, there is a time for timelessness. And I think that expresses love in such a wonderful way. Uh, I love the repetition of more than all, all your more than eyes. Um, I think that's really clever. Um, and I think just E. Cummings in general is really clever at writing poetry and writing poetry that you don't feel like you need to understand to appreciate, um, which is lovely. Another poet that is fantastic that I really recommend you guys go read is Ocean Vung. Night Sky with Exit Wounds is a masterpiece um, and I have two poems here to share with you. Um, what I love about Ocean's poetry is that it, it uses metaphors in such a spectacular way. Like I think um, he is a master of metaphor, um, and yeah, let's just let's just let the poems express themselves. So this is called Head First. Don't you know a mother's love neglects pride the way fire neglects the cries of what it burns. My son, even tomorrow you will have today. Don't you know? There are men who touch breasts as they would the tops of skulls, men who carry dreams over mountains, the dead on their backs, but only a mother can walk with the weight of a second beating heart. Stupid boy, you can get lost in every book, but you'll never forget yourself the way God forgets his hands. When they ask you where you're from, tell them your name was fleshed from the toothless mouth of a war woman, that you were not born, but crawled head first into the hunger of dogs. My son, tell them the body is a blade that sharpens by cutting. <laughs> so um, his poetry is also very dark, um, but I just love the, if the opening simile, a mother's love neglects pride the way fire neglects the cries of what it burns. <sighs> like, yeah, and like the thing is, I, you don't need to analyze it to get it, you know? Um, another fantastic poem in here is called Into the Breach. Um, once again, these poems kind of lend themselves to being read as well because of the way they're spaced out on the page. But yeah, okay, Into the Breach. I pull into the field and cut the engine. It's simple. I just don't know how to love a man gently. Tenderness, a thing to be beaten into. Fireflies strung through sapphired air. You're so quiet, you're almost tomorrow. Body was made soft to keep us from loneliness. You said that as if the car were filling with river water. Don't worry, there's no water, only our eyes closing. My tongue in the crux of your chest, little black hairs like the legs of vanished insects. I never wanted the flesh. How it never fails to fail so accurately. But what if I broke through the skin's thin page anyway and found the heart not the size of a fist, but your mouth opening up to the width of Jerusalem? What then? To love another man is to leave no one behind to forgive me. I want to leave no one behind, to keep and be kept, the way a field turns its secrets into peonies, the way light keeps its shadow by swallowing it. So, I mean, not only is that a fantastic description of the struggle of being a gay man, but also, you're so quiet, you're almost tomorrow. Like, how beautiful is that? The unknown future is this quiet silence, and you're so quiet, you're almost there, you're almost not here at all. Um, the, the line, the flesh, how it never fails to fail so accurately. And 
to keep and be kept the way a field turns its secrets into peonies, the way light keeps his shadow by swallowing it. I just love the way he uses language. I think he is a master. I think, once again, you don't need to have an extensive knowledge of anything to experience these and to really be moved by them. Um, and I hope that makes my point. And I think when you hear a really good metaphor, when you hear a word being used like an E coming to the spring is like a perhaps hand, um, like there are parts in your brain that shift, can, new connections are made and you don't need, you just, you don't need an explanation. So I hope that answers your question um, about how to read poetry. I don't think there is one way to read poetry. I think there are a multitude of ways to read poetry. I think that we shouldn't be intimidated by poetry. I think it's a beautiful expression, just like art. No one, no one, that's the thing, like philosophers have argued about this for ages about, is there true beauty? Is there a correct way to judge an aesthetic? Thing. Is there a correct aesthetic judgment that can be made about things? And I think that there isn't. I think that we can just appreciate it. And I think we can learn from it, but I don't think we need to explain what we've learned. I don't think, again, to quote Matilda's video, which everyone should go watch, I'll link it in the description, um, is that we there's, there's a misconception that meaning requires understanding that the experience of finding something meaningful means that you have to understand it from an analytic perspective and i don't think that that's true so yeah thank you so much for watching this video i hope you enjoyed it i think this is going to be the last video that i make this month i am going on vacation and i don't have time to pre-film and edit and schedule and upload everything so um expect me next month in September with a lot more poetry videos and by that I don't mean poetry discussion videos like this one I mean straight up poetry but also um, hopefully artistic film style stuff because that's what I'm really like eager to make and since I'm going on vacation I'm gonna have a lot of opportunities to film really beautiful scenes and I'm very excited to make some more artistic stuff on the channel um, so yeah thank you so much for watching and I will see you guys in September uh, I hope you have an amazing rest of your summer and See you later. Bye.